Ladies and gentlemen of the Ring Crew Army, welcome to Season 2 of the Square Circle Podcast. I am your host, Marie Shadows. On Season 2, Episode 1, I will be reviewing in full AEW Dynamite that debuted on January 6, 2021. That's right, Ring Crew Army. We've made it through 2020, and I have good hopes for an amazing 2021 podcasting year. I took a bit of a break due to being burnt out with what I love the most. I hope going forward I can stay consistent while bringing you guys value with my reviews and solutions to nagging wrestling industry problems. Season 2 of the Square Circle Podcast is dedicated to show reviews, character and storyline analysis, practice match commentary, and more. If you want to join a vibrant community over on my newsletter, theringcrew.substack.com, then by all means, sign up. And don't forget to share this new podcast episode with your friends. So, let's jump right into AEW Dynamite on January 6, 2021. So, January 6, 2021, AEW decides to name their show New Year's Smash. This is night one. It starts off with SCU and the Young Bucks teaming up to take on the Acclaimed and TH2. This is an eight-man tag match. It was really great, fast-paced, back-and-forth action. It started out with an all-out brawl after Daniels hits Max Caster. Combination by Cast Bowen, Nick attacking THQ, Jack Evans with a spin kick to Daniels from the apron, TH2 tag team work against Daniels, Daniels hits the blue thunder bomb on Bowen, there's a hot tag to Kaz, and then Matt Jackson comes in on his hot tag where he does two flying sentons and one spear, then there's a cross body on the two guys on the outside, there's the risky business by him and Nick on Bowen's. And then Nick and Kazarian team up to do the BTE trigger. There is a super kick party followed by a DDT. That DDT is on Jack Evans. And then the best Meltzer driver, which Daniels sort of does and helps out Matt. So what happened was that I guess it was a little bit of a botch, if I want to say it on this podcast, where Nick was about to do it, but he lost his footing, so he decided to turn around and do a cross body on the guys on the outside, and then Christopher Daniels went up to the top rope, did his best moonsault ever, while Matt Jackson had his opponent in the position for the Meltzer driver, and bam, that's how we got the best Meltzer driver ever. After that, SCU picked up the victory for their team with the Young Bucks in this eight-man tag match which is very good to start off AEW Dynamite. Kazarian grabbed the mic, mentioning how last week he gave Daniels the ultimatum as them as a team. If they lost one more time, they would no longer be a tag team. However, Daniels also grabs the mic, and you can see that both Daniels and Kazarian feel good about, you know, them winning the match that night. So he basically says that one day, eventually they would challenge for the AEW Tag Team Championships that the Young Bucks have. I personally want to see that in the future. And the Young Bucks accepted that challenge agreement and hopefully SCU can climb the ranks to become number one contenders to face the Young Bucks when that time comes. After that, we get Moxley coming out into the ring. He cuts a promo on Kenny Omega. Everyone thinks that he'll be upset after what happened on December 2nd, where John Moxley lost the AEW championship to Kenny Omega with slight interference. So the one line that I took from his promo is, you crossed the wrong guy. Eventually, down the line, we're definitely going to get a Kenny Omega versus John Moxley part three. We just don't know when it's going to happen. But right now, John Moxley is focused yet again on Kenny Omega to probably get the championship title back. After that, we have a backstage interview. Dasha is interviewing Orange Cassidy and Chuck Taylor. Trent is out with a torn pectoral muscle, meaning one of the muscles in his chest basically is torn. So he's going to be out for a while So as Dasha interviews Orange Cassidy and Chuck Taylor, in comes Miro and Kip, and they start talking about young boys, and basically a young boy in the business is that someone goes around with their 
mentor and carries their bags for them, does this for them, does that for them. Basically a young boy. You are learning from your mentor, thus you are a young boy. This usually happens more in Japanese culture for professional wrestling rather than in the States. Sometimes it happens here too where the young wrestlers that come in, it's out of respect to help out the veterans and carry their bags and do this and that. It's just a very old school way of thinking and it was done way, way back in the day probably still happens now just because if you want to be respectful to the older generation, that's what you would do. In my experience, I haven't seen it live, but I once helped out the ladies of um, Shine uh, to bring their bags upstairs uh, to help them get settled uh, before any of the audiences uh came in and this was when i was doing ring crew for shine and then it went into evolve later that day so i was helping out the women that came in the ones that came early helped them up the stairs with their bags and stuff and had them get settled that's me paying my dues ladies and gentlemen during that interview miro throws out a challenge to chuck taylor where it's going to be chuck taylor versus miro Next week, night two of New Year's Smash, and Miro decided to add a stipulation to it. If Chuck Taylor loses to Miro, Chuck Taylor becomes the young boy to Miro until after Kip and Penelope's wedding. After that, we get Hager versus Wardlow. This is a straight up wrestling match with two big men. All I have here is Wardlow does a senton to Hager. Hager with the triangle choke. There's a second rope triangle choke. However, Wardlow drops down. This allows Wardlow to get the upper hand because now Jake Hager is stunned and staggered. And that sets him up for Wardlow to easily give him the F10 to pick up the victory. I was surprised that they had Jake Hager put over Wardlow. Wardlow is super talented. He has a really nice look to him. I just really think he needs a better finisher. He does not need the F10, which is similar to the F5 that Brock Lesnar does. I understand if you're a big guy and trying to market him as the next Lesnar, but it just doesn't work. He would need to find his own identity in the world of professional wrestling and that's what I want all wrestlers to do is to find their own identity and stick with it as for Wardlow I wouldn't know what other big man move to give him because every big man move has been done maybe if he does a submission move it'll be a little bit different it'll be something fresh because all of that weight that he has on him can definitely have you tap out depending on what it is If it's a move where it kind of restricts your breathing a little bit, you could definitely tap out for that. He could get the victory from there. If it's a move that hurts your side or something, you know, he could get a victory from there. However, if he does choose to do a submission move, he needs to work on the body part to help weaken that body part and therefore help him pick up the victory faster. I don't think having the F10 does anything for him. Him doing the senton from the top rope, even though I really think that's a swanton. Um, It was more a swanton. Um, You know, as a big guy, you don't really need to do top rope moves if you're not thoroughly comfortable with it. And then it looks kind of weird because um, big guys with all that muscle looks weird flying through the air. But sometimes it can catch you off guard and you could be like, oh my God, that was great. You know, there's certain times where it's necessary. Um, In this match, I don't think it was necessary because it just didn't feel right. This match is mainly a wrestling match, but I'm glad that Warlow is, you know, Warlow has no fear in the ring and he's able to show us what he really has and all the potential he has. It's just that there's some guidance that needs to happen of changing his finisher And I think he will be okay. As for everything else, he has it. I just don't think the F10 as a finisher, which is just a rotation in throwing the guy, 
does anything substantial. Sure, it can knock out your opponent and stuff, but why would you want to be compared to another wrestler when you can carve your own identity and have something new and fresh to introduce as being a big guy? Because big guys do the same moves over and over and over. Why not do a submission move? And as you're wrestling base, work on the body part that you need to weaken in order to get the victory. After that, we have the Team Taz and Darby weigh in. Darby Allen is the TNT champion, and he will be defending that championship against Brian Cage, who holds the FTW championship out of Taz's team. Now, I don't know why the TNT championship is on the line and not the FTW championship as well. Both of those championships should be on the line, and whatever happens, happens. But I believe this story is starting to get dragged out a little too long. I want to see where it goes. I'm not going to say to just scrap it because now we have Sting in the mix. And Taz and Sting never really stood in the same ring together. Imagine back in the day if Taz versus Sting was an actual match that happened. It would have been so great. I'm excited that Sting is in AEW, that he's around again in professional wrestling. I didn't like how his WWE run happened. I did not like his match with Seth Rollins. Seth Rollins injuring him, even though Sting, you know, is a stand-up guy and wrestling is wrestling and things happen in wrestling, and I totally get it, but you're not going to... Seth at that time should have thought twice about throwing an older veteran gentleman into the ropes like a buckle bomb. If Sting was in his prime and a little bit younger, he probably would have been able to take that move. But unfortunately, it just didn't work out that way with Sting being a little bit older. I do not think that, I think DX at that time when they had the whole NWO and DX Sting face-to-face I think DX won. I don't think that was the right thing to do. But then again, this is just my opinion on that. It has nothing to do with AEW at all. I'm just excited to have Sting back in the wrestling picture. No matter what he does, Sting is amazing. And then you also have Tony Schiavone there on commentary, you know, doing his patented It's Sting. And that just brings childhood memories back and a huge smile to my face. So I'm happy about that. As far as Sting and Darby Allen teaming up, for the lack of a better term, is very interesting. But, you know, when it comes to the week after night two of New Year's Smash, I basically need to see more interactions between Darby and Sting, not just both of them looking at each other, even though looks and pictures can tell more words than anything else that can ever happen. So a picture is worth a thousand words. Looks are worth a thousand words and so on. Sting comes out to help Darby Allen because Darby is already getting ready to fight Team Taz because he knows how this ends. For weeks, Team Taz has been terrorizing him. So he's already prepared for any type of beatdown that's happening. So... Sting comes out, saves the day, bam, that's it for that segment. Next, we get Cody Rhodes with Snoop Dogg by his side versus Matt Seidel. The only reason why Snoop Dogg is on an AEW program is because both him and Cody Rhodes are judges on the show, the Go Big Show. This match was really good. What I have in my notes is a high roundhouse kick to Cody. That was by Matt Seidel. Running drop kick in the corner. Meteora move to Cody. That was from Matt Seidel. Cody accidentally hit Serpentico. Chop exchange. Cody gets the knees up on Seidel. Second rope. Front face splash. And then Cody Rhodes does the crossroads two times on Matt Seidel to pick up the victory. After that, we have the women's match, which is Abaddon versus Sheeta. Sheeta is still our AEW women's 
champion. I am still waiting for someone to take the belt off her. I don't think she has a unique run, but then again, this is one of the weakest aspects of AEW is that the women and the women's title are sort of like an afterthought, and I get it. It's AEW Dynamite. You have two hours Technically, an hour and a half, give or take, the commercials that you have to put because you're on cable television, you're on TNT. So sometimes, depending on how you book AEW, the women may get the short end of the stick. You know, there's just tiny little fixes that can be done to help out the women. And, you know, you don't have to show all women on the match card. Like, you know, I know you can't fit in everybody, but you can utilize BTE. You can utilize Sammy's vlog or you can utilize any other vlogs that these women want to do to show a different aspect, to show a different angle, to create some content and put it up on the internet so that way they're not forgotten and so that way we know that they're still with the company and that eventually feuds and stories can be created from the content that they put up. If you guys pay attention to Twitter 24-7, there are some women from the AEW roster that put up really good promos that promotes their matches and this is a plus. Just recently, Alex... Gracia created some video content that she put up on Twitter promoting her match against Kylan Kane. And Kylan Kane came back with a response of her own to promote their match. And I thought that was beautiful. Where these women took the time out of their day just to create a 5, 10 second, maybe a minute video explaining why you, as the viewer and the fan of women's professional wrestling who loves to watch wrestling can tune in on AW Dark to go watch them. The more times that you watch the women, the more that they will be on AW Dynamite. And I don't understand why people don't follow this simple logic. The more you watch the women, the more you support the women, the more you talk about the women, eventually things will start happening. It won't happen overnight and it won't happen within the week. But everyone can make tiny little strides to make it happen and make it a reality that we could at least get two different types of women's segments on AEW Dynamite. That does not mean that the men matches should be cut short or be cut off. There should be an equal balance between men and women matches and men and women segments, but not completely take off the men matches just to please the vocal people on Twitter who just don't want to see male matches. But yet then we'll say, oh, well, this guy is sexy and I want to see his matches. Like, there needs to be a balance. That's all I'm saying. There needs to be a balance between all the segments. I honestly believe in AEW to bring the women to where they need to be. They just need to focus on it. And like I said in the previous podcast in 2020, I am here. I have a lot of time on my hands and I do not mind being the face of the women's division in terms of booking and guiding and making sure that these women have a voice these women have little avenues to explore meaning that if they're not booked for AEW Dynamite maybe on AEW Dark other than having a wrestling match they can start up a angle with somebody else be on the waiting room and mess around with Britt Baker or on the sidelines you know start a vlog for them like how BTE started and it was just a vlog of the wrestlers going from town to town to town, we could definitely have something similar for the women where, you know, they talk about their training and their regimen and what they hope to gain, what they want need to work on and cutting promos and all this kind of stuff. I have no problem doing that. It's just a matter of you guys giving me all the support in the world to make sure that AEW knows that I am here and I am for AEW and I do not mind working with them. I'd rather work with them than WWE. Yes, that's right, ladies and gentlemen. If you are new to this podcast, if you are new to hearing my voice and hearing the Square Circle podcast, I used to work for WWE. I no longer work for WWE and my new goal is to work for AEW in 2021. 
just to help out the women because I do know that the EVPs are probably stressed out. So if you guys need the extra help, I am here and I have lots and lots of ideas that I would like to talk over DMs. And yes, I know I'm putting myself over and not talking about any of the matches, but the AEW women's division gets me so passionate that I will go off on these little tangents because I want to see the women succeed as much as the men succeed. I only aim to have an equal ground between both sexes. It won't be one sex has priority over the other one because of some stupid bullshit. No, it is both of them working as equals, working as telling unique stories. If I get so passionate about the men's storytelling, I need to get passionate about the women's storytelling. And I could tell you one thing that in the Abaddon versus Sheeta match, a lot of things were missed only because there could have been a deeper story in this. Abaddon is unlike any other female competitor out there and male competitor out there. She is a living zombie. She haunts your dreams and she will definitely bite you and she has this magnificent presence. So imagine if Abaddon did win the AEW Women's Championship title, which, by the way, spoiler alert, I didn't get to my notes, but she does not win off of Sheeta. Sheeta retains the title. But if Abaddon did win, imagine the presence that she would have backstage. One thing, it would be Halloween 24-7 in AEW for 2021. And I don't know why you guys didn't want to go with that. It would have been super fun. You guys could have did lots of different angles, lots of different skits. It, sh- it could have been previewed on BTE, Sammy's vlog, or just make a whole new vlog. You see where I'm going with this? So AEW could have had content for 2021 and not worry about, oh, what are we going to do next? If Abaddon would have been champion, they would have had so much content for 2021 that the women would have been fine. The women would have interacted with Abaddon at every which point you could think of due to skits, promos, just weird things happening because she's champion and the women are trying to figure out, do I maybe align myself with Abaddon because people are scared of her and she could be an insurance policy for them. And then later on, try to have a match with her, but then lose because Abaddon is like, you know, I knew that you were going to try to take the title from me and that's not going to happen. You know, the women can band together to see how they can defeat this entity that they have roaming around the hallways. The other thing, too, is that Sheeta, she comes out as a samurai character. Why didn't they think of having her place Japanese spell tags around the ring and around the guardrails to help her defeat this demon? Why didn't they try to think of using Japanese lore for this match? This match could have really put the women on the map in terms of creative storytelling, in terms of thinking outside the box, and it could have worked. What I had originally liked is if this match went to a draw because it can extend the story and then we could get so deep into Japanese lore, demon lore, zombie lore, and have fun cinematic matches with them. It would be fun. But we went the route of let's have an ordinary title match. Weeks prior, uh, Abaddon had bit Sheeta in the neck which was very interesting, which I liked. And that's why I had mentioned that their match should end in a draw to bring out this story. Now that Abaddon got the loss and Sheeta retains the title, what is next? Who is there else to face Sheeta that is quote unquote TV ready? They didn't set up any other angle after that match, which is a loss. But, you know, I hope that in the future, AEW can think outside the box with the women and dive more into cinematic matches when it comes to Sheeta versus whoever else and Abaddon versus whoever else. As much as we want professional wrestling, sometimes 
to really escape from things. It's cool to dive into the fantasy world and build from there. Matt Hardy has made a huge living off of the broken gimmick that he does and all the other characters that he has invested his time into. And that's all I'm asking from AEW is to invest their time and their thoughts and their resources into creating wonderful women matches that don't necessarily have to be all wrestling, but it can definitely take us on a journey to try to understand their characters on a deeper level. Because I don't really understand Abaddon well. I understand the outside of Abaddon, meaning that she is a living dead girl. She is a zombie. She will bite you. She will scream at you. It, she will fight tooth and nail to get what she wants. I get that. But is there any other layers underneath all that can bring the character full circle, can bring the character great? Like we all cheer and love Bray Wyatt and The Fiend and The Fiend has so many layers and he's doing the Firefly Funhouse and all that. And we all attract to that because that's really cool. Why can't Abaddon have the same? And this is where, again, I'm going to offer my services to AEW. And if you guys are listening to this podcast, make sure to share it so that way they know. Simple enough, I'm here to help out the women's division to think on a higher level to get them over because the men are clearly over and the men are very creative. The women are just stuck in a box and I want to open that box and have them have so many different avenues for them to have fun with because not everything has to be a wrestling match. Cinematic matches are really a great spectacle to watch and you can have fun watching it. Stadium Stampede is still one of my favorite cinematic matches that AEW has done it was really great so you know why can't the women have it the women did have it with Britt Baker versus Big Swole in the tooth and nail cinematic match but that could have been done a little bit better for what we got it was great I just think that more cinematic matches should definitely test the waters on how creative professional wrestling It truly is because professional wrestling is not just wrestling. It's everything. It's creativity. It's thinking. It's writing. It's everything in this world that brings us together on a creative standpoint and where it can help us evolve into better human beings because we understand the stories behind it. And all we want to do is just talk about how great these stories make us feel. And AEW is all about having you feel a certain type of way when you watch these matches. You're not going to talk with your friends about, hey, this wrestler did a headlock, an arm drag, an arm drag, a hip toss, another headlock, pushed them off into the ropes. They did the shoulder tackle thing, and then they did it again to a drop down, and then they jumped over it, hit the ropes, and then another hip toss. We're not really going to talk about professional wrestling in that manner unless we have two technical wrestlers and while they're doing that sequence, they're also telling a story about who's stronger, who's smarter, and who could adapt more. See, those are the matches that I love and I could definitely break those matches down and just even thinking about it is getting me excited. But back to the point of... AEW makes you feel in their matches. So when it comes to the women's side of AEW, I want to feel the same way that I feel watching Kenny Omega, the Young Bucks, Hangman Adam Page, the Dark Order. I want to feel the same way, meaning happiness and being in awe and being inspired by the story that they're telling inside the ring. I want to feel the same way that I feel with that, with these women matches, whether they are regular matches or cinematic matches. I can tell you one thing for sure. Thunder Rosa is the only woman to make me feel as excited about watching professional wrestling as when I was telling you that simple little sequence a couple seconds ago. She makes me feel 
very excited to watch women's wrestling because she gets it. Everything that she does, you can feel it. You can see it. She takes this seriously. I'm not saying that no one else takes it seriously, but there's a difference in level and sportsmanship and just wrestling prowess that, you know, can get me excited. All I'm saying is that the women need to come out of the box that they've been put in. And again, I am here for that. I have ideas for the women and I would definitely love to be part of the women's team to help elevate them to the best of their ability and to make sure that they're thinking the big picture rather than just the small picture and what can happen at that very moment. If you have it done that way, then you're always going to be asking the question of what's next? What's next? What do I do next? I don't know what to do next. If you plan it out to where you have enough content and you're able to give the fans something every week, then you'll be okay. You don't have to worry about the what's next. You could definitely focus on the what's next and create more content, but you don't have to frantically every single time be like, hey, what's next? What do I got to do? By the way, Sheeta ends that match with a knee strike and she ends up picking up the victory. I do appreciate though that Abaddon dragged Sheeta underneath the ring and bit her and that was really great. And now we get to the main event of AEW Dynamite. It is the AEW World Champion Kenny Omega taking on Ray Phoenix. This match is set for a 60 minute time limit. This match was beautiful. Beautiful. Ray Phoenix is one of the best wrestlers to watch in the ring. He is super athletic and I really do enjoy the innovative moves that he does. Luckily, he does not do it every single time. So there is a special awe to it. So I love watching that. So let me just go through my notes. There is a jump up her Karana to Phoenix that was done by Kenny Omega. Then Phoenix returns with his own answer to Kenny Omega's her Karana with one of his own. There is a chop exchange. Then Kenny smashes Phoenix's lower back into the barricade. Step dragon suplex to Phoenix. Phoenix jumps over the guardrail and Kenny countered it with a snap dragon suplex. Kenny slams Phoenix back on the apron and the guardrail. Then Kenny does the Kataru Crusher. There's a backbreaker to Phoenix. There's the double springboard dropkick that Ray Phoenix does. And it is so beautiful. There's the dive senton to Kenny from Phoenix. A flipping German suplex from Phoenix to Kenny. Phoenix then decides to do a double stomp to Kenny's back. Kenny then decides to do a V-trigger to Phoenix. Phoenix does a kip up and a super kick to Kenny. That combination was beautiful. Sometimes people on the internet will say that AEW guys do not sell. You have to understand that adrenaline is running through these guys. And sometimes to make it look like a really cool fight, your adrenaline will kick in and bam, that's how you deliver the next sequence in that combination. And Ray Phoenix is really great battling Kenny Omega and doing that and bringing out the most of their in-ring storytelling ability, which is starting to become a lost art. And there are times where I can see where people don't sell and they should sell. However, my response to that is think of it as a gladiator match where these opponents are in the ring and they want to show up who can be the best person and they're not going to take you down unless you take them down. And if you can hit harder than they can, then you better do it. And then when both of you guys fall, you know, you tell that story. You tell that story of that your opponent is not going to hit you harder than you're going to hit them. That's what it is. After that, it is a power bomb, then a V trigger, then a reverse her Karana to Kenny from Phoenix. The outside inside cutter to Kenny. Phoenix did that. Fire thunder driver. From Phoenix to Kenny. Kenny gets the knees up to stop Phoenix from the frog splash. And then the Tiger Driver 98 to Phoenix. Then a V-Trigger. And then finally the One-Winged Angel to put Phoenix away. And Kenny Omega retains the AEW World Championship title. 
Now, at the end of the match, John Moxley decides to come out. He comes out with a bat wrapped in barbed wire and he hits Kenny Omega. Sometime later, Luke Gallows and Carl Anderson, the Impact Tag Team Champions, come into the ring to defend Kenny Omega to save Kenny Omega. And then wrestlers decide to hop the guardrail, come in and try to stop the mayhem, but Anderson and Gallows are destroying them. Finally, the Young Bucks come out. The Young Bucks should be the voice of reason. They try to calm everything down. Kenny is back up. And then the weirdest thing happens where Griff Garrison and Brian Pillman Jr. decide to hold Kenny in the ropes. So that way you would think that the Young Bucks would attack Kenny and, you know, will go that route. No. Gallows decides to hit Brian Pillman and Matt Jackson super kicks Griff Garrison. There is a bunch of confusion inside the ring. Kenny Omega is even confused. Matt is a little upset with himself that he had to do it. So what's the next thing that they do? Kenny Omega throws up the two sweet sign. Obviously, Gallows and Anderson join Kenny in this hand gesture to say that their allegiance is with him. And then the Young Bucks. Nick is the first person to join Kenny with the two sweet sign as well. And reluctantly, keyword, reluctantly, Matt joins up with Kenny Omega. And apparently the band, the Bullet Club, is back together. I honestly did not like that ending. I really didn't. And that's my criticism for AEW there. I usually criticize Cody Rhodes, but I'm not going to do that in 2021. Hopefully I can keep that promise. But this criticism for having the band and the Bullet Club, whatever you want to call them now, get back together was to me. The wrong way to go. The execution of it was awkward and weird and it shouldn't have happened that way. I think it's way too early that the Young Bucks decided to join Kenny Omega. Kenny Omega should have continued on the path that he was going. He does not need the Young Bucks right now. You know, I could totally get the big picture that all of them are champions. And we have two tag team champions from two different companies. I totally get that and I could see it, but... My whole biggest thing is that sometimes you cannot strike twice with magic. And yes, the Bullet Club was very huge in New Japan. And there are countless fans on Twitter and all over the world that will say, oh, but I never experienced the Bullet Club in Japan. You know, what's so great about the Bullet Club? So bam, you want to bring it to the States. You want to bring it to a national stage like TNT every week people get to see it unfold even in impact you get to see it unfold so you know I get it you do fan service for people to experience the Bullet Club that had never experienced it before however when the split happened for the Bullet Club when Cody Rhodes was once the leader of the Bullet Club when he was in Ring of Honor that happened but that Bullet Club was just not as great as anything and Cody Rhodes is not a leader to lead the Bullet Club. So that was a really bad decision to have Cody as a leader. Regardless of that, the Young Bucks and Hangman was with that side of the Bullet Club, the United States Bullet Club, while Kenny and the rest of the guys were still in New Japan Pro Wrestling doing the Bullet Club over there. And by the way, New Japan Pro Wrestling does own the name of the Bullet Club. They trademark it. Do not tell any other wrestling fan that they do not. The Bullet Club is trademarked by New Japan Pro Wrestling. Anyway, back to AEW Dynamite's Bullet Club. I just think that it was bad timing. It was the wrong way to go. I want to see how it plays out. I'm not happy about it. And I'm trying to write this article to explain why I think it didn't work. And what they should have done. Because Don Callis is always like, oh, you know, we're on a higher level consciousness and, you know, no fan gets it. You know, no fan is like us. They're not as smart as us. Well, that was very predictable to have the Young Bucks join way too early, but predictable nonetheless. 
So that wasn't a higher consciousness of thinking. And I will be the first to admit that Kenny Omega is my favorite wrestler. He is my number one, and I usually do not criticize him. Well, I really don't criticize him. I praise him because he is a very smart man, and he has told a lot of stories in the business, and I love his way of storytelling. And Don Callis has a way of talking where I enjoy it and I want to learn more and I get where he's coming from. But in this particular instance was not a higher level consciousness of thinking to get people off their guard in what they know as professional wrestling. So yeah, it was just not the right time, definitely misplaced, but we can't really do anything about it now. But going forward, we could definitely try to improve it. I just don't think that the Young Bucks needed to join up with Kenny at that moment only because now you have the EVPs doing what they want and Matt Jackson, by him kicking Griff Garrison, just alienated all the roster. So how is the roster going to be able to trust you now and your judgment about anything if you're willing to kick Griff and anyone else. This is where the battle line was drawn when you had two people come in from a different company, attack your AEW crew, and then you're going to go side with Anderson Gallows and Kenny by kicking Griff and then also too sweeting and also doing the too sweet sign to legitimize that. Yeah, we're going to be on Kenny's side and We're going to alienate everybody by doing that. So now you have to think about who's going to save AEW from this mess. It might as well be Cody leading the charge, but Cody's been in so many different feuds and I don't know if that'll be the right choice. My choice to save AEW from this wild mess will be Hangman Adam Page. Hangman Adam Page needs his redemption story. And 2021 should be his redemption story in long-term storytelling and also take the belt off of Kenny Omega when it comes to the year ending. So that way it could be a fulfillment. And Hangman definitely needs to change up his character where he is no longer the millennial anxious cowboy, but the cowboy, the Hangman, have confidence in himself. It's 2021 and as a professional wrestler of his caliber of his talents of his amazing in-ring ability that should just relate to being confidence and take on Kenny Omega the Young Bucks and do it with the support of the Dark Order and I think that that would be the greatest thing to do have the Young Bucks drop the AEW tag titles to the Dark Order have have Kenny Omega drop the championship to Hangman, and we'll see where it goes. Everything that I've talked about in this podcast episode are just fantasy bookings, just thoughts that I've held on to, and now I get to say it out into the world, and it's not the most graceful because I'm coming off of a hiatus, and I'm getting back into the groove, and my groove is really out of whack, and I hate it. But you guys get where I'm coming from. You guys know that I love professional wrestling. You guys know that I will do anything to help out professional wrestling and to help out my boys because I love professional wrestling through and through. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, that was my review of AEW Dynamite that debuted on January 6, 2021. I am so glad that you guys are listening to this episode. I am so glad that I got back into this Because I miss talking to the millions of my fans out there about professional wrestling and how to change up some stuff and how to think differently about professional wrestling and what solutions and value I can give to the professional wrestling world and to your ears to help you enjoy wrestling further. This is season two, episode one of the Square Circle podcast.